Mark Azoulay is an industry leader in psychotherapy and men's mental health. He's helped countless guys get back on their feet, deepen their relationships, and excel in their lives. Now he's taken all that he has learned and is sharing it with you. In each episode, Mark will interview an expert in the field of masculinity and men's work. We'll cover topics such as emotional intelligence, masculine identity, anger management, financial health, trauma recovery, marriage and divorce, ethics, and spirituality. Tune in and become a better man. Welcome back to the Men's Therapy Podcast. I'm here with Amy Novotny, and we're talking about the link between mental health and physical health. Amy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. So in the first segment, we always start with kind of the personal story. Um, How did you get into doing nervous system work? So I started in physical therapy. I got my doctorate in that, and I did that for a few years. At the time, I was considered a good physical therapist, did orthopedics, helped people with some chronic pain, and I always thought there was something else. It seemed like there was a segment of the population that didn't get to better quickly, And that made me really curious. And at the same time, I was running marathons, training to qualify for the Boston Marathon. And I started running on the treadmill eight miles, three times a week in 55 minutes. During that time, I had my the typical runners, little aches and nagging pains here or there. And I started to shift the way I held my rib cage and the way I breathe. So different from breath work, but more I focused on my breathing mechanics And when I did that, I could start to get rid of any pain I was having. I'd get off the treadmill and I didn't have to stretch, foam roll, scrape, all the things that I was teaching people to do as a physical therapist. I stopped doing just cold turkey, stopped doing it. And it took me a little bit of time, but I realized that I was making a true change to my nervous system and I was learning how to control it. And that set me off on a whole new path. So I left the physical therapy world and switched over into nervous system work because it had such a profound impact on me and my ability to run marathons or longer distances pain-free. And I was starting to help people in a different way as well, where if I worked on their nervous system or helped them with it, they could get themselves out of pain. Yeah. So I, I love the idea of like, you know, the scientist that experiments on herself type of thing. Um, how did you how did you go about figuring that out? Like, how did you move your rib cage around and have yeah. the idea to start to tinker? Well, it started with, I took some classes through a institute called the Postural Restoration Institute, and they got me to just start thinking differently. So, you know, when you go to school, you kind of learn some things, you, you just take it and apply it. Well, they were different because they said, well, your body's asymmetrical, so you can't just apply everything the same on each side. And you have to start looking at breathing and anything that's inside you, you need to start looking at. So that at least got me to start thinking differently. And so as I was thinking about some of the things that they taught and I was running on the treadmill, you have time while you're on the treadmill running, you just, you can either listen to music or you think. So I was thinking. And so I just started playing with it. I just, I literally start, started doing things that were opposite what we were taught. Mm-hmm. Instead of sucking my gut in to give myself this great posture, I let it out. And when I let it out, my rib cage dropped down. When my rib cage dropped down, I felt relaxed. All of a sudden, my hips freed up. I didn't have any of the aches and pains. I didn't have the tightness. All of a sudden, I didn't have to stretch. I didn't have to do the hamstring stretching or foam rolling. And it was because I let my belly button go. I stopped sucking it in. And so I started having to study more about breathing mechanics, more about the nervous system. And so I could put things together. Once I realized, hey, when my rib cage is down, it supports the diaphragm differently. So my diaphragm works different and that stimulates the vagus nerve, which then calms me down. And so I just started putting things together. And of course, I could experiment the opposite way and ramp myself up too. So that was that's the great benefit is not only did I could or could I experiment on myself and go both directions, but then I could teach other people to do it and say, hey, if you're running out of a burning building, suck your gut in and run as fast as you can, or you're at the end of a race, sprint and suck it in <laughs> and see what happens. Or if you're wanting to calm down, I want you to do this. And that's literally how I got started in this work. 
That's cool. So you really found like a lever or like a dial that you can ramp yourself up or calm yourself down. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. hundred percent. And I've used it in many situations <laughs> to where I've tested it too. I've done really crazy endurance feats where I've tested it and seen, okay, does this stuff really work when I push my body to the limits? And it did. I did some crazy back-to-back ultra marathons and marathons just weekend after weekend of doing things just to trash my body and see if I ramp myself up on a race, could I calm it down in the middle of the race? And then could I calm it down in between races and do another one the next weekend? And yes, I could and not have injury. That's yeah. cool. I mean, I, I like the idea that you're just like experimenting out there in the field. Um, so I'm hearing you know, the the obvious application for athletes, I think specifically endurance athletes. What about for like the regular person, right? Like how can this help to benefit them? Yeah, absolutely. So m- half of the, the people I work with are not endurance athletes. Well, probably maybe 75% are not endurance athletes. So this applies to anyone with other types of pain, like chronic pain, um, people with arthritic arthritic conditions that they attribute the pain to the arthritis, but it's not necessarily so. So people that are going in for different joint replacements, we can get the nervous system to calm down. And when it does, it releases the abnormal muscle hold on the joint and the joint starts to move and f- have a fluid type of flow. And so they don't have the impingement and their pain goes away. And there's other just... You decide all of a sudden one weekend you want to go play flag football and you start running and maybe you pull your groin. You can use it for that as well. Um, It's a weekend warriors. It can be any other types of pains as well. And then the other application, which I didn't start off with initially, but has become very much part of my practice is the mental and emotional aspect, trauma, anxiety, stress, panic, PTSD. That definitely has a... um, a very strong connection to the nervous system and we can work on calming the nervous system down to address those issues as well. Yeah. Can you tell us more about that? I mean, maybe starting by giving the listeners like a primer on the connection between, you know, body tension and pain and mental anguish. Yeah. So what I tell people is we all have different types of pain. We can have physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain, and there is typically some kind of trigger that comes with it. And then again, that trigger can be physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, intellectual. There can be many different types of triggers and they can lead to whatever your pain is. When we have a trigger, if you think about you're driving down the road, all of a sudden maybe the traffic got bad and you can feel yourself tense up. So what happened is the fight or flight nervous system kicked in and put you on guard because there's a whole bunch of traffic in front of you and maybe you're late. Your body responded by causing muscles to tense up. There are common muscles that will tense up in that scenario. But beyond that, we each have a unique set of muscles that will contract even more on top of those common ones. Over time, the muscles that contract, they start to pull your bones and joints out of position. If they do it enough and you have a strong enough trigger, the next day you wake up and you're in pain. And you may not have had an injury or anything, but you have pain. Left shoulder, low back, right hip, whatever it is, could be left low back. You have this pain that shows up and you're not really sure why. And what had happened was mentally or physically or emotionally, you had a strong enough reaction that put you in fight or flight mode that told your body to contract muscles to protect you in some way. Those muscles pulled your bones and joints just enough that tissues now butt up against each other. Or in the case of anxiety or stress, your body starts to shift positions. Your breastbone starts to get more and more prominent and starts to shove higher and higher forward and out. And all of a sudden, your breathing mechanics change just enough that you feel like you can't breathe, that you feel like you can't calm down that there's this edge all over your body and all of your muscles are just on edge. So whether it's pain or stress or anxiety, there is this physical change that happens in our body. And then because this all happens so subtly, we don't recognize how to get out of it. So sometimes when people have pain, they say, okay, I'm just going to rest for two weeks. And that might be enough that they calm down enough. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes with anxiety, they can go on vacation if it hasn't been a long-term form of anxiety, something where it just kind of crops up, they might be able to get out of it. But often they can't. They've ca- crossed over a threshold where there's been enough physical change in the body that now how their body is being held is contributing to their anxiety and stress, panic, or pain. And that's not to say that that's the only cause for these issues, but I'm saying they're contributing to the stress and pain. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, so when I started my journey on like mindfulness and meditation, right, one of the first things I noticed was how much pain I hold in my body literally all the time, yeah. right? Like how tight my neck felt, how sore my lower back felt, how I felt like I was, you know, had one shoulder cocked up higher than another, like everything just felt out of whack. And I was like, oh my God, like this is all the time, isn't it? Right. Like I just, for some reason, you know, I, I can be numb to it because it becomes the normal. But I imagine I'm not alone in the fact that I think many people carry pain around all the time to some extent. What do you think about that? Absolutely. And the problem is people often give the reason of pain away. They think that it's because of an injury 20 years ago, or they think a chiropractor has to push on them in order to get them out of pain. And that might be part of of what's out there as a reason But if we can start to take some ownership back and think, okay, my pain is because my body has learned to keep me in a position that is not normal for my body, and that position is causing the pain. So if I can now change the position, I can change the pain. If I can change the nervous system, I can change the way the muscles are behaving on a body that's out of position. So if I start to put both of those together, I now have some power back and I can do something about it. And so you can start to influence and change pain, whether it's mental, emotional, or physical. You can have control over it again. It's not easy. My words sound very simple and they are simple when you hear them, but it's not easy to do. It's not easy to implement because so often when we've had an experience where we're triggered, we often shut off the brain's ability to sense a part of our body. And when that happens, that makes it harder for you to change how you hold your body. Yeah. So uh, I'm interested in your explanation because I love the way you're talking about it because you have talked on this podcast about similar things, but there's always this kind of like vagueness to it. And I just love how like precise you are. Um, so, So I'm curious, like what you think about the idea that emotions are held in the body So for instance, like I've started doing CrossFit and I notice when I get to the edge of my range of motion, I get like sadness, right? Or fear or terror or things that like don't really fit with the workout, but Mm -hmm. there is this like emotional holding. um, And I'm working with a PT, you know, from the gym, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But like this idea of like, as we open the range of motion, there can often be big emotional reactions. Have you seen that in your practice? And hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. There are there are certain common areas where I see that people hold stuff and when they start to get that area to free up or open up, it becomes very emotional. So I'll give an example, the armpit area, armpits, the breastbone, the top of the breastbone, below the breastbone, the front of the hips, the low back. Those are all areas where people are, holding emotions that have come from the past and they become very additive. And so when I'm working with someone and I'm getting them to release that breastbone to melt in one to help with anxiety or stress or pain and two to help their body get back into a neutral free flowing position, but three to get rid of some of the emotions that are stored in that area it becomes very problematic for people when they can't release that and they feel stuck. But at the same time, they often feel vulnerable when the breastbone does release in. And sometimes they might flail. Sometimes they might cry. They might shut out. There can be an actual varied response by having that release. And the other part of it is the nervous system is going to try to kick back in and guard back again. And so a person needs to learn how to stabilize in that new position once they've felt that release. 
right? Have it not kind of like rubber band back to that old defended position, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if there's science has this, but like, how do emotions get stored? I don't know. Like, what's the, like, what, what's in there? <laughs> you know, like, what is, what's the juice of that? Or how is that locked away? Do we, do we know? Or is it just this like weird phenomena? Well, it's part of the sympathetic nervous system response. Yeah. So part, when that nervous system gets triggered, our response is to tighten up muscles. So your brain associates a muscle tightening with an emotion that is meaningful to you. So if you experience something and there is some meaning to it and your body's physical response is to contract, let's say your armpit, you you contract the pack and your, your arm comes in because you it, it that emotion that triggered caused that you're basically associating the two together mm -hmm. so it's an association that this armpit being closed in your right side your arm being at your side that's protecting you from that emotion that you experienced at that time so it's an association pattern that you're creating and so if you don't want to deal with that emotion you're not going to likely let the armpit relax. You're going to keep the arm guarded by your side. So there's these neurons and connections that actually happen, unfortunately, and it happens throughout our whole life because we're not trained to release it on a daily basis. That's really clear. Thank you for explaining that. That makes a ton of sense. And yes, like the idea of like the last time I was just open, I was really sad or I was really angry or I was afraid. So like, let's not go there again. Um, we're going to move to our first commercial break. When we come back, we're going to dig deeper into this topic and talk specifically about areas where men tend to be stuck, which, you know, my kind of novice understanding is a lot of hips um, and a lot of like traps, but you can let me know I'm right about that when we come back. Um, so if you're listening, hang on in there and we'll see you on the other side. Want to see what Voice America is up to behind the scenes? Follow us on TikTok at Voice America Talk Radio. Men's Therapy Online is now accepting new members. Men's Therapy Online offers a solution to the lack of outlets for emotional expression, positive role models, and access to meaningful milestone experiences. In our post-COVID world, loneliness is at an all-time high. Men need consistent community. Our society is rapidly changing. Old models of masculinity are falling at the task of promoting emotional intelligence and meaningful connection. Men's Therapy Online offers tools and experiences designed to help the man who is struggling to balance traditional male roles and emotional fluidity. Whether you need to get back on your feet or take your life to the next level, Men's Therapy Online has your back. We help our members become a true 21st century man. A man who is not burdened by the rapid change of society, but who contributes to it honorably. If you're interested in signing up and finding your band of brothers, go to menstherapy.online to learn more. That's menstherapy.online. Start your journey today. Do you ever feel like you're just going through the motions? Jan Jones wants to boost your energy and ignite the power inside you. The Good Good Life with Jan Jones. Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Success starts here. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com. It's your world. You are listening to the Men's Therapy Podcast with Mark Azalay. To reach the show today, please call 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to podcast at menstherapy.online or visit www.menstherapypodcast.com. Now, back to the Men's Therapy Podcast. 
Welcome back to the Men's Therapy Podcast. Um, Amy, you did a phenomenal job of, I think, explaining the connection between the mind and the body, where emotions get stored, how these patterns can kind of get set over time and be really um, sneaky in some ways, right? Because it's kind of like the frog uh, boiling in the water. So I'm curious to go a little bit deeper and specifically around um, male clients, right? Being the Men's Therapy Podcast, we got to talk about dudes. I'm curious, what are some common defensive patterns, I guess, I guess, emotionally and physically that you see in the male clients that you work with? So very common, if you think about like a Superman posture or military posture, I see that to, regardless of the weight of the person, um, where they puff out their chest, they suck their gut in, um, they pull the shoulders back. And so often a lot of emotions get stored at the base of the breastbone, right in the hips and the low back. It's very, very common. Um, we're often kind of told in society that it's women that whose hips should move and be able to sashay back and forth. Men are supposed to have that as well, but we often kind of see men as a solid block of cement and it doesn't have this fluidity that it should, that a person should. And I often use the example of like a boxer. So when we think of like a boxer or a fighter, they don't have that Superman posture. Their ribs are actually down. There's not this rib flare at the bottom where the gut is sucked in. Their their ribs are actually down and they have both power, speed, flexibility, mobility because they have been trained to hold their rib cage down. And granted, they do have a protective nature in that sport, but they can't hold that protection all the time. Otherwise, they won't be able to punch. They won't be able to kick. And so part of working with men is recognizing that they do have areas where they store some of these emotions. And we have to work through that. But also, I have to be scientific and explain how things work so that the brain can absorb it all and put it to work. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, depending on the the male and the person, I often don't dive into emotions or even talk about them unless they broach it with me. I'm very, very scientific, very specific, and I have to make sure I prove everything. So if I tell you your breastbone is in the wrong position and it is causing your pain in your low back where you're guarding emotions, I have to very quickly get you to feel that. Yeah, yeah. And... And and feeling sometimes for men is not a top priority. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more visual stuff, but I have to get you to feel it very quickly. So I might have to put you in several different positions to, to elicit it as quickly as possible so that you buy into what I'm saying so that you can even trust me that I'm actually leading you on this path and not just BSing my way through a session. Yeah, I think the the safety and the trust is huge. You know, I mean, I think about my my experiences working with a PT, and it's like the idea of like I'm in some really painful stuff that I self judge shouldn't be that painful, right? Because it's like little micro movements that's like, oh my god, mm-hmm. right? And and I think as a a client or a patient, I have to relax during that, right? I, I need to make sure that I'm not like fighting it, and I'm not like like you said, counter resisting or snapping back. So I think there is a lot of this like rapport building of like, oh, can I trust that this person knows what they're talking about and that they're not going to like, I don't know, shatter my ankle or something, right? And that I can feel safe enough to relax and and let that stuff sequence and discharge. Right. And many men are very back dominant where yeah. their back muscles move them and the fight or flight nervous system lies along the back. So the more the back muscles are kicked in that compresses on the sympathetic nervous system, the more the body is tight. And I often hear, oh, I have tight hamstrings. I need to stretch, stretch, stretch. And the first thing I say is, no, do not stretch those hamstrings. You're trying to apply something external to the body to cause a muscle to stretch, but the nervous system is telling it to contract. Mm -hmm. So you are potentially stretching a muscle that shouldn't be stretched and instead Let's learn how to teach the nervous system to release that muscle. And let's teach the back muscles to stop compressing on that nervous system that's causing you to tighten up. And that's a huge concept for a lot of men. Mm -hmm. Because if we can get them to release the back 
and not be in this power pose all the time and to learn how to relax, they feel better. And I can help change their emotions without even talking about emotions or having them talk and tell me what's going on. Obviously, I'm always open for someone to tell me something that's going on, but a lot of times they don't even want to say it. But if I can get them to calm down and relax and feel better, they either might be able to address the situation on their own or with their therapist better, or they might say something to me, or the situation resolves because their behavior changes in their environment outside of our sessions. Right. Yeah. It's real bottom up work, right? You're you're really changed like the foundation Mm -hmm. that like their emotional mind overlays. Yeah. I know you talked a lot about the the power pose. I'm I'm curious about like, what about like the nerd neck pose, right? Or like the kind of slunch slouched over, you know, desk worker pose that I think a lot of, you know, men and women really inhabit. What's, what, what is that one like? There is. So a lot of times, even with that slouched over posture, the back muscles are still working. Mm -hmm. The back muscles are still working to try to either pull them back on the top half of their body, or if they're slouched, the lower back muscles are working to support them because the back isn't touching something. So depending on the person, we have to work on getting them to get their rib cage where the rib cage is touching the back of a chair. So it can learn to relax down into a neutral position where it's not overarched and not over slumped. But how do you hold yourself in this neutral position that's relaxed, that gives you the freedom of movement in all the joints in your body? And so there's this interplay in getting someone to sense and feel all that without going to either extreme. Yeah, how do you do that? I mean, that's, it sounds like it's it's magic. I mean, it's... It, it's this is a step-by-step process. Yeah. <laughs> that's not magic, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> These people work really hard to accomplish this. But we'll start in a seated position. We'll go on the back, laying down, maybe the feet up on a chair. We do some work on the side, work on hands and knees, work on standing, maybe possibly kneeling. So depending on how the person's body shows up, and I do this on Zoom, so I'm watching their body constantly, Whatever I see in their body, it all I can explain it and I'll point out to them, say, hey, this left side of your rib cage is flared up, you're tilted sideways, you're holding yourself in this power pose, but maybe slightly slumped in this area. So I want you to sit here in this chair. We're going to have your knees at the height of your hip crease. We're going to have you work on your hand going down on your left lower ribs. We're going to have you breathe out. And as you breathe out, I want you to feel the ribs sink in so your low back releases and you calm down. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example of something I might do with someone. And then I'll, we do that for a few minutes. And then I ask him, well, how do you feel, Mark? Did you, what did you feel? And I don't ask, I don't try to trigger. I just say, what do you feel? What did you experience? So based on what they told me, you said, hey, okay, I could feel my chest go in here. And I could feel my ribs start to go in. I could feel maybe my back relaxing a little bit, but not fully. And so, okay, we'll take that information. Now I'm going to have you do this, this, and this with your body to try to get you to the next step where you can feel the back relax. And so that's, we just work through your body to get you to the point where you can feel the breastbone melt in, ribs drop down, the belly let go, your body just soothe itself. And often, and I have a new, I have a new client that I just started working with who is very ramped up. And he told me his problem was he's always felt like he was never enough. So he has done every sport you can imagine. He's built businesses. He has um, challenged his body. He's had multiple, multiple surgeries. And he said it's all because he wasn't, he didn't feel like he was enough. And so I told him, I said, when we start doing this, you might feel really tired and sleepy. That is okay. And I want you to go into that Mm -hmm. because part of being not enough is I need to be awake at five in the morning. I need to be um, meditating and working out and building a business and having a family and eating healthy. And, And it was from morning to night, this is him. And I said, when you start doing this and calming your nervous system down, you have to be okay with sleeping. You have to be okay with being lazy so your body can recoup from being on edge your whole entire life. 
And I have to warn people that because that's a real phenomenon. And if you've been on and pushing and pushing and pushing your whole entire life, you will try to resist this feeling of relaxation. But your body has to re-equilibrate. And it has to get used to how to feel relaxed and have energy and not equate that with being lazy and being a slob. And that's hard. It's hard. And that's the emotional work right there, right? I mean, a lot of the guys I work with have that exact presentation. And like that fear of being a lazy slob is also the fuel that they've, that their success is powered by, you know? They have the unfortunate side effect that you talked about where they don't feel any of that success and they feel empty and hollow and pissed off all the time. But yeah. like there is a, a there is a real benefit to that. So the idea of being like, hey, you might have to give up the fuel that's been running your life can be really difficult, um, but necessary, right? Because I think that correlates with like, I don't know, heart attack and cancer and all, all these kind of long-term health issues, right? It, it really does. And once they realize that The drive that they used to have that's contributing to their successes and also contributing to their health issues, they can actually change how that works. Mm -hmm. So they recoup the energy that's being given off on this drive, 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 and actually feel calm and still accomplish pretty much all those successes, but in a calm way. Once they realize that they can make that switch and still accomplish everything, you do not switch back. Yeah. And I say that, and I granted I'm a female, but I used to be that way. (laughs) I used to conquer the world and not sleep and all of that. And so there are females out there that are that go through that as well. But I know it's very prevalent in with males and learning how to shift that and still have the energy is it's a fabulous feeling. Let me tell you, it's amazing. I know it's making me envious. I got to call you after this podcast and get on, get on your client load. I mean, that's, that's like, that's magical to be able yeah. to switch to like that renewable energy source and that calm energy source. Um, now we talked a little bit over the break about how this could apply to entrepreneurs. I think you're saying some of that, but um how about direct, like how, how does this work with entrepreneurs and leaders and people that are kind of, um, you know, on their own in some ways? Yeah. So w- some of the benefits that s- people have mentioned and I've seen in people is their emotional reactivity is less with their business, whether it's sales aren't where they should be or with their employees, the emotional reactivity. So they have a better work environment. The other aspect is stress is less. Um, they can be more focused on whatever tasks that they're looking to accomplish because they can calm themselves down and then put energy towards what they need to put energy in. Their creativity improves as well because they're not in such a heightened state that they're not on edge all the time. I have a gentleman right now, he's a VP of a national company and he travels quite a bit. And when I first started working with him, he was really ramped up on edge and he couldn't sit still. And he was also a a runner and he used running as his form to calm himself down because it basically beat it out of himself. But as we started doing things, he noticed that his relationships with both coworkers and at home changed quite a bit. And he even said to me, he's like, gosh, I feel calm all the time. He's like, things just don't matter so much. I don't get wound up on stuff. And and every time I work with him, he comes to me, he's like, oh my gosh, I can see my coworker so ramped up. And that that coworker so ramped up and that employee ramped up. Like, why in the world are they so ramped up? And I say to him, that's how you used to be. It really was. And now that you can see that you don't have to be that way, share the wealth. Tell, like, try to try to have, you know, those conversations with your coworkers and see if you can calm them down a little bit and just get them to shift their energy. Because when you've shifted your energy and you can now feel the difference when someone's really just coming at you and they're wound up so tight on something that's so insignificant. And you can switch your brain from being this emotional reactive brain into a solution oriented brain, which is ideally what we want as an entrepreneur. We're all about how do we find solutions for the customer to help our business grow or shift and change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
That's just so real. It makes me think of um, uh, Eckhart Tolle, his idea of a pain body. Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it, yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's what you're talking about. It's, it's, it's like a, so there's a spiritual lens of, to this too, this idea that like we carry around this trauma and this pain and it's physical, mental, psychic, emotional, all of it. And just what he says, like once you start to heal your pain body, you become almost painfully aware of everyone else's. Yes. Because you're like, one, you're more open. You're not in your own kind of like mental storm. But two, because you, you're you familiar with it, you're like, oh my God, that person really is suffering right now. Or that person is depressed. Like you just get more clear seeing. Absolutely. And it's vital. It's really yeah. vital. And your health, other health benefits from that just go through the roof. Um, we know that stress affects every organ system in our body. So the more you can calm yourself and change how you perceive what's going on around you, the better it is for from head to toe, inside and out. Oh, yeah. So we're going to move to our final commercial break. Uh, when we come back, Amy's going to give you some exercises that you can do immediately if you feel inspired by this podcast. So stuff that you can just take on the road and, and start practicing. So if you're listening, hang on in and we'll see you on the other side. Voice America is on LinkedIn. Connect with us today. Men's Therapy Online is now accepting new members. Men's Therapy Online offers a solution to the lack of outlets for emotional expression, positive role models, and access to meaningful milestone experiences. In our post-COVID world, loneliness is at an all-time high. Men need consistent community. Our society is rapidly changing. Old models of masculinity are falling at the task of promoting emotional intelligence and meaningful connection. Men's Therapy Online offers tools and experiences designed to help the man who is struggling to balance traditional male roles and emotional fluidity. Whether you need to get back on your feet or take your life to the next level, Men's Therapy Online has your back. We help our members become a true 21st century man. A man who is not burdened by the rapid change of society, but who contributes to it honorably. If you're interested in signing up and finding your band of brothers, go to menstherapy.online to learn more. That's menstherapy.online. Start your journey today. Are you inspired by stories about personal empowerment, well-being, and the motivation to achieve more? Get ready for Next Steps Forward with Chris Meek. Each week, Chris will talk with experts and icons from different walks of life who personify energy, direction, excitement, and purpose as they take bold steps forward in pursuit of excellence and service to others. Tune in to Next Steps Forward, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. We're on Facebook, along with some of the greatest minds of the world, and that includes you. Visit us on Facebook at Voice America Empowerment. You are listening to the Men's Therapy Podcast with Mark Azalay. To reach the show today, please call 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to podcast at menstherapy.online or visit www.menstherapypodcast.com. Now, back to the Men's Therapy Podcast. Welcome back to the show. In this segment, we talk right to you, the listener, and give you some take-homes that you can do right away. So, Amy, take it away. Where can people start if they want to do some of this work? Sure. So, I'll give a little bit of uh, some suggestions. Obviously, they can go to my website and learn more about it, but let's get, let's get real and talk about what can you start with. So for those of you who are sitting, um, or if you're not, please sit. <laughs> and let's sit back in a chair with a tall enough back to it that it gets to your shoulders. When you're sitting in a chair, and this should be how you sit all the time, especially if you're sitting for a prolonged period of time, you want to sit all the way back to the back of the chair. Let your low back touch the back of the chair without putting a lumbar support there. If you have back pain, you might need that lumbar support initially, but eventually you want to be able to not have to use it or not rely on it. But let's say you don't have it. You let your low back sit all the way back in the chair. Let your tailbone tuck under a little bit. So it should feel like you're slouching a tiny bit. 
you want your feet flat on the ground. And then look at the height of your, your knees compared to the crease in the front of your hip. For most people who are six foot two or lower or shorter, the chair is often too tall. Often the knee is lower than that hip crease. So we want to get it at the level of the hip crease or slightly higher. So either lower the chair or put something underneath your feet. And I'm being very specific on this because how you position yourself will determine whether or not you can relax. So once you get into that position, you can start to sense the low back possibly relaxing a little. Okay, That gets us into the state where we need to to start changing our breathing mechanics. From there, we can start a little bit of a little bit of a breathing exercise. We're going to focus a little bit on how you exhale and changing how you exhale. You can't change the way you inhale until you change the way you exhale. So we're going to do a little bit on how you exhale. What I usually tell people is to use a straw, cut it in half and put it between their lips. That helps us blow out a cylinder of air which we're trying to get our rib cage back into a cylinder formation, not an hourglass formation. Okay. So if we then take one hand and put it on our chest, one hand on our belly, sitting back in that chair, we're going to do a four-step process. We're going to breathe in through the nose, pause and hold our breath for a second, blow out through our mouth, and then pause and hold our breath for two to three seconds. That's just the very beginning to changing your breathing mechanics. So we'll go through it and I'll just coach you through a little bit more beyond that. Okay. So if you want, if you're listening, go ahead and just close your eyes. Just try to get rid of any other input. So one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly. We're going to gently breathe in your nose. Pause and then blow out through your mouth or straw. Hear the air coming out of your mouth. Hold and breathe in. Feel the air go in your nose gently and blow out. Feel your chest melt in under your hand. Blow all the way out. Hold and breathe in. Feel the air go in your nose gently and blow out. Feel your chest melt in. Feel the ribs drop down. Your belly comes out. Hold and breathe in. Feel the air go in your nose to your throat gently and blow out. Feel the chest melt in. Feel the collarbones drop down, ribs drop down. Hold and breathe in. Feel the air go in your nose passively and blow out. Chest melts in. Feel the wave as your low back lets go belly softens. Hold and breathe in. Feel the air go in your nose to your throat and blow out. Feel the chest melt in. Feel the rib cage drop down. The belly softens. Hold and breathe in. Feel the air go in your nose without a lot of effort and blow out. Feel the chest melt in. Feel the ribs dropping down, the belly softens. One more. And breathe in. Feel the air go in and blow out. Feel the wave going down your body as your ribs drop down away from your head. And take a break. So what we were doing there is we're just getting started with changing the mechanics of how you breathe by first putting you into a position that suits your body to be able to turn off the fight or flight nervous system. What we were doing there was just going over changing how to get your exhalation to adjust so that you stop clenching the belly and you work on releasing it out as the chest goes in to help the body start to release some of the tension it's held over the years. Now, for some, they may feel the chest go in, they may feel the belly spill out, but for others, they may not feel either or they may feel one or the other. If you can't feel either or if you can only feel one or the other, that doesn't mean this is a wrong position for you and you shouldn't practice. I would still say practice it, but it means we need an additional position to get you to be able to sense that happening. 
So that might mean I put you on your side or put you on your back or curl you up or put you on your hands and knees, depending on the person and what else is going on in their lives. So every piece of your history matters. Your medical history matters, your emotional history matters, your stress history matters, your dietary history matters, and that would determine what positions are good for you to elicit the response so you're successful in feeling what we need you to feel to calm down. Man, that was really great. And I'd encourage you all to like download that, listen to it again. Um, Do you have exercises like that on your website where people can go and watch or on your YouTube? I do it on my YouTube. So I do have... Obviously, there's interviews on my website, but on my YouTube channel, I do have um, some breathing exercises on there that goes through that. Cool. And that'll be in the show notes if you want to take that with you and and practice, um, you know, at home. I'm curious, before we wrap up, Amy, like we talked a lot about the people that are really spun up. Do you work with people that are not spun up enough, right? Like I'm thinking people that are maybe depressed or, you know, feel very lethargic or heavy or that kind of thing. I do. It's not as often as most people are ramped up, but I do work with people who are depressed, but there's an underlying ramped up feeling. Occasionally I'll get some people who are very lethargic or very just like they don't have enough tone in their body Hmm. and they're just kind of like this puddle and there's an underlying depression that's associated with it and for them we work a lot on stabilization and still feeling because when a person can feel something and they can produce that feeling that gives them a sense of control and a sense of confidence and it starts to boost them up okay so you can work from either end of the spectrum right yes mm-hmm. yep. yeah yeah i'm wondering do you have like it's a fancy i have about you do you have like a second sight can you like tell people Um, tell their emotions based on how they move through the world or how their posture is? Like, what's it like to have this knowledge? You can read people really well. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious what that's like, yeah. It it feels, it's great. Um, I try not to read into it and try, and I work very hard to not make anything up (laughs) that I don't see as true, but I can get a sense of if a person's on edge or if they're ramped up. And what I'll do is I'll change myself to work to bring them down. Mm -hmm. So if a person's really ramped up, I will ramp myself up a little bit to then ease them out of it. And I don't do it to play on people at all, but I do it to try to help them as much as possible. But I can watch people just going to the stores and I can see if someone's ramped up or what's going on. And it, it does take some practice. And I, I have a new little baby. And so I'm very conscious of, how I am with him to make sure that how I am and other people are, I can keep him calm. And he's actually a very chill baby. I don't know if that's the case, but you know, I do my best, but it is, it's a lot of fun to do this also in a room where I'm speaking in from in front of an audience. I'll change myself based on the feel of the audience and how people are responsive. And you can have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I can imagine so, you know, and it kind of links to psychology where we talk about like, you know, when you're having an argument or de-escalation tactics, right? The idea is that you want to like, you don't want to go all the way down because if it's too disparate, right, the person continues to escalate, but you want to go like right below where they are and then Absolutely. they'll go down and then you go right below where they are and then they'll go down and you can like kind of ladder them down. Yes. And I have to change how I hold myself and how I position myself And then what I can do is if I'm working with them, I'll see, or if like, let's say we're talking, I'll change how I stand. Mm -hmm. And then if I get them to calm down, I might say, Hey, let's go sit down. So I'm just slowly getting them to curl up or, um, you know, just shift their body. And it's really powerful. That's very powerful. Yeah. 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 So uh, I'm curious as for another tool, Do you have something that someone could do to diagnose themselves to see if they need to do some of this work or maybe some symptoms that they might be experiencing to be like, hey, maybe I need to look into my nervous system and and get some help in this department? So, yeah. So anytime if you're emotionally reactive, water spills and you have a a reaction to that and you should definitely get some help. Um, On the emotional world, yes. Anytime you're struggling with different relationships, 
then I would look at it. From a physical, if you have any type of pain, then this can help. From another physical way to look at it is if you feel the lower front ribs on your body, and if you have your hands on those lower ribs and you drop down from there, and you feel like there's a a drop off, like it caves in or the ribs are flared out, you can definitely do some work. If you look at yourself in the mirror and you can see that your rib cage is high, if you're standing and you feel your weight not on, on your heels, highly likely you can use some work. If the, they're on the balls of your feet, you need some work. If you look at your body position, your posture, if your pelvis is in front of your your shoulders or behind your shoulders, this could work. This can be some work for you. Um, if you're having anxiety and you feel ramped up, if you're having trouble sleeping and you have a, a mind that's racing, it's another thing. Insomnia is something we work with as well to calm the body so the mind can calm down so you can fall asleep. Um, digestive issues is another place where you can see a problem is when you have digestive issues, it's usually nervous system related as well. Yeah. So really it's connected to all kinds of different things. And I'm hearing like, if there's like a feeling of like antsiness or, you know, itchiness or, or just tension that you carry with you, I think it can be helpful. And and I would just, yeah, want to endorse it. You know, I think doing body work is critical on the mental health path. Um, like I said, for me, it was really my entry into mindfulness. I realized like, oh my God, it's more than just me, like changing my mindset you know, I need to deal with this pain that I carry around or you deal with this trauma that's locked away in all these weird places in my body. And it's this idea of um, a holistic care, you know, so I really appreciate you coming on the show and presenting this more physical side of things. Um, so I think it's, it's critical for, for health. Um, so as a wrapping up, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and about your Institute? Yeah, sure. Can I say one more thing before I say that? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I just want to, put this out there that when you have pain, it's not just in your head. Mm -hmm. I have never worked with someone and I've worked with a lot of people over the years. There was always a physical component. I've had many people been referred to me and the word malingering was, was told to me. They weren't malingering. There was a physical component to their pain. So, and I say that because people can get very frustrated when they have a physical pain and people just say, oh, it's just in my head. I'm like, no, I want you to know, I do believe there is a physical reason, even if you do have stress and other triggers. So I just want to put that out there because people need to be validated that we can always find the reason why there is a physical pain. So just keep that in mind. So I just wanted to say that. Um, but the best way to find me is paberinstitute.com. It's P-A-B-R institute.com pain awareness breathing relief and then institute.com right yeah and you can you know book it for some coaching sessions you have your youtube that has all the yes. breathing techniques so they don't want to do it on their own there's tons of great resources there it's a wonderful site um so definitely go check it out if you're interested in learning more if you want to work with amy um if you want to just explore some of this um you know, I, I think you got a sense from this conversation that she's going to prove it to you, you know? So if you get on a call, she'll make you feel stuff. She'll make you uh, move around. You know, she definitely puts her money where her mouth is. So Amy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. It's a pleasure. Yeah, and if you enjoyed this show, um, send to someone who you think might also benefit from it. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We're working to build those up. Um, like us on Spotify. Just get it out there. It really helps to get those messages out to guys that want to um, work on their mental health and to help break the stigma around you know self-improvement, right? Like we all need help. Doesn't mean anything's wrong with us. Get out there, make it happen. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next week, another episode of the Men's Therapy Podcast. Thank you for joining your host, Mark Angela, on the Men's Therapy Podcast. Be sure to tune in again live next Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel and anywhere podcasts are found. To support the show, leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. For more information or to apply to be a guest, visit www.menstherapypodcast.com.